Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm NBC 10's Erin Coleman. We are following the latest on the coronavirus pandemic in our area. And as you know, New Jersey is one of the hardest hit states. Let's get right to New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. who joins us live now. Good morning, Governor. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Erin. Good to be with you. All right, New Jersey now has more than 70,000 cases of COVID-19 in the state. The vast majority of those cases are in North Jersey. How has South Jersey been able to keep its numbers so much lower? Who or what gets credit for that? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. The counties that have been hit the hardest are the half dozen that are in the northeast, central northeast part of the state, and they're part of the metro New York reality. You've got an enormous amount of folks who go back and forth every day into New York City, uh, into New York State from those counties. And the extent to which New York City got became a hot spot uh, very early on, uh, we were a part of that reality, whether we like it or not. And as uh, we, we have acknowledged, over 3,150 lives in the state have been lost. But it's important to note, and you're absolutely right, the impact so far, and I'm knocking on wood here, uh, in South Jersey has been less, far less than it has been in North Jersey. We have cases in every county and we have fatalities in every county, uh, tragically. Again, with a lot less of an impact. Um, I think it ha has to do at least so far uh, with uh, outstanding um, uh, aggressive moves in our healthcare system and public safety. Uh, we've, we've regionalized the state. Uh, uh, Cooper Medical is the sort of coordinating uh, uh, health center for the South region and, and and Kevin O'Dowd and their team have done an outstanding job. I think it has to do with the fact that while Philadelphia has been cited as a potential next hotspot, um, it has not yet, thank God, exploded like New York uh, City exploded. Uh, and with all the interrelations between South Jersey and Philadelphia, that's also a factor. We shut the casinos down. Didn't bring me any joy to do that. But that's a huge gathering spot. Uh, parks, uh, both state and county, are closed. So a lot of the lessons that we've learned tragically uh, in the North and in New York City, I think we've applied. And, and so far, at least, that has kept the numbers down. Not at zero, sadly, but they've kept the numbers down in South, South Jersey. Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli uh, talked about working to increase hospital bed capacity. Some of the hospitals in North Jersey, they're certainly feeling more of a strain uh, than in South Jersey. What talks have happened about potentially transporting some patients from North Jersey hospitals to South Jer Jersey hospitals to help out? Is that something that you're considering at this point or have talked about? Yeah, we've talked about literally almost everything and, and moving patients around is certainly, particularly when you have hospitals that were uh, uh, less so right now, and I hope it stays that way, hospitals up north that were going on, on divert, meaning they could not take anyone else and patients had to be sent elsewhere. I mentioned in passing, uh, Judy put in place with her team and my, my certainly my blessing, a regional strategy. So it's north, central, south, and the moving around of, of pe people, patients, healthcare workers, assets like beds and ventilators has really taken place within regions. But we have augmented uh, and continue to augment uh, South Jersey here. Uh, we are uh, within days of having, thanks to the Army Corps of Engineers and our own teams, a field medical station up and running and functional in Atlantic City. Uh, that will add up to another 250 beds. You know, one of the realities going into this crisis is while there is population is lower in South Jersey than in the North, and there's no question about that, the existence of uh, critical care, hospital beds, hospital beds, period, uh, is underpenetrated in the South as well. And so that field medical station will hopefully at a minimum give us an insurance policy, if not augment capacity that we'll need uh, from day one. This morning, we're uh, learning about more than a dozen bodies piled up inside a nursing home, uh, a morgue at a nursing home in Sussex County. Uh, it seems nationwide the number of deaths at nursing, nursing homes is surging. Are you taking any precautions to give nursing homes the help that they need to care for people and to make sure that these nursing homes are accurately reporting these cases and these deaths so that the state can then accurately report the numbers? Yeah, I mean, Aaron, that story is outrageous and, and tragic at every level. Uh, our teams, including I've asked the attorney general to look into this uh, 
uh, ag aggressively to determine here what 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 happened when to whom etc. But it's an awful story, and our hearts and prayers go out not only to the memories of those who were lost, uh, but to the loved ones of those who were lost. You know, long-term care facilities, not just in New Jersey, but as you rightfully point out, around the country have really turned out to be a weak link uh, in the armor against this awful virus. Uh, not only are we taking action, but we have been taking action. In fact, we had an awful uh, a tragedy in a, in a home, a group home for youth uh, in, a, in a Wanakue in Passaic County a year and a half ago. And even from then, we, 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 we required each of these homes to have a, an emergency response plan. Uh, we have been trying, pounding away to try to keep out ahead of this. And it's been a whole mix of realities here. You've got folks who are in a nursing home for a reason. They're, they're likely you know, older and or they've got other adjacent health challenges, and that immediately puts them into the crosshairs. Um, you've got health workers who work there, particularly in the early days, who were unwittingly going in and out of facilities, asymptomatic, but carrying the virus. Uh, that's something that we have, you know, we've dealt with a whole range of steps on personal protective equipment, um, cohorting of patients, accepting no new patients, limiting any visitations to end of life. There's a whole series of steps we've taken, but this is without question, not just in New Jersey and America, proving to be one of the hardest nuts for us to actually crack. Mm. Taking a look at the calendar now, you know, we're just weeks away from the summer season down the shore. At this point, a lot of beaches, boardwalks, they're closed. People are staying away from the most part, but the weather, it's going to get nicer. People are going to want to get out, maybe get to a vacation home, a rental home. Are you concerned about that? And overall, what do you think this summer season is going to look like down the shore? I mean, Aaron, I am. I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't concerned. I, I am. And, and I don't blame people. I say this every day, and I, I feel like uh, somewhere between Dr. No and a broken record, or, or probably both, particularly as the weather, um, as I sit here, it's a beautiful, sunny day, a little cool, but a beautiful, sunny day in Trenton, as I look across the Delaware River, by the way. Uh, the fact of the matter is folks have been doing this for weeks upon weeks in terms of staying home, social distancing. And by the way, New Jersey's done an extraordinary job. There are always exceptions, but um, we, we look at heat maps by county every day, and each day it's gotten better. And that's a tribute to everybody, all nine million of the folks in this state. But particularly as the weather gets warmer, particularly after they've been doing this for weeks, there's an, there's an absolute understandable frustration uh, building up, and we completely get it. But I have to say, at least for the for now, folks have to stay at it. What's my crystal ball say beyond now? I think April is going to be the balance of April. We're still in the thick of the war right now. If we all do our part, we will. I, I'm I'm confident break that that curve and and begin to go down the backside of it sooner than later. I think May is probably a assuming we continue to be vigilant. I think May is a better month than April. Uh, and, and I would love to think that in the warm weather, responsibly, with, with some important health care infrastructure in place, and I have to say this, we're going to need much broader testing than we've been able to do, given the, the lack of, of uh, national uh, reality of, of universal testing that we have not had. We're going to need to be able to test people much more broadly and quickly. We're going to need to be able to contact trace if we find some hot spot and have a plan to quarantine, assuming we've got that infrastructure in place and we're working doggedly with Rutgers, with the federal government, the, the White House, uh, with other players to get that, assuming we can get that, I think we can begin to get back on our feet um, in, in the warm months. I think it'll still be important to not congregate in, in, in close proximity, uh, but I do think we can begin to find our way to some sort of a new normal. You've been coordinating with a lot of different entities, including other governors from other Northeast uh, states, looking ahead to an eventual reopening plan. How will that work for South Jersey, especially with its close proximity and bridges to Philadelphia? Yeah, it's, it, you, you raise a very good point. We, we've sort of got three rings of focus here. Number one, within the four walls of New Jersey, what do we need to do to break the back of the virus? get the healthcare infrastructure in place, and then begin to open our economy. And, and you rightfully note that we announced a couple of days ago, we were also going to coordinate with other states in our region 
and that list includes Delaware and Pennsylvania. So I'm very happy that John Carney and Tom Wolf are a part of that, and their representatives will be a part of that, and that's an important uh, reality. And again, we may not do every step exactly as the other states have done it, but to at least have some harmony, some amount of coordination. For us, the big one up north is obviously New York. Uh, but if we can get the region sort of in, a, in some kind of harmony, that helps all of us. And then the third ring of cooperation and, and, and working reality is going to be with the federal government. There's no replacing a robust response or role from the federal government. And those, so, so those are the sort of three rings of action that we see are going to be necessary before we start to get back on our feet. Sticking with the, uh, the reopening plan, if you will, can you specifically talk about which businesses um, would open first, could open first? Would there be several weeks between when one group of businesses opens before we then see the next wave opening? What are you considering? What are you talking about? Yeah, I think, Aaron, honestly, it's too early to give you a definitive answer to that. I, I wouldn't want to lead you one direction and, and, and not have all of our T's crossed and I's dotted. I will repeat what I've said already, and I'll just say it as a headline. We need healthcare infrastructure, particularly testing in place. I know that's that comes first. Uh, and I think we open up from a very small core set of essential businesses that we've allowed to operate it sort of begin to undo those steps over time. I could see a reality, by the way, and I'm, don't hold me to this, but I could see a restaurant reality that looks something like the following. Somebody outside is checking your temperature or some sort of test as you come in. The bartender, the wait, the wait staff are masked and wearing gloves. There's a much more aggressive surface cleaning uh, protocol in place. The restaurant's limited to, say, 50 percent of capacity in the early days. Tables have to be X feet apart. Those are sort of elements that I could I could reasonably see in what what a restaurant, for instance, look looks like as we as we begin to get back on our feet. Mm. When you think about schools, are you considering shutting down schools for the rest of the year like uh, Pennsylvania has? Governor Wolf made that announcement um, last week. I won't step on my own news, but we're going to make an announcement about uh, schools uh, later today. Uh, and so bear with me on that. We're putting the final touches on that. And, uh, and so if you could bear with me on that one. What do you think has to happen before schools can reopen in the fall? And, and how do you make parents feel comfortable at that time, even letting their kids go back to school, being in that environment in several months? Yeah, I think you've got to have a number of things that have to be in place. I think you've got to have broken the back of the virus. You've got to have that testing uh, reality in place. I think you've got to have new protocols in terms of what a school configuration looks like, in terms of spacing of desks, um, how, you do, how you do assemblies, how you do gatherings. I think sports are going to be a big question for folks to we're going to have to grapple with that, everything from the, the big professional teams to the, to the local and, and school scholastic teams. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're hopefully, you know, I'm not a medical expert, but, uh, you know, Tony Fauci uh, privately with me and publicly again today, hoping that a vaccine is a year, year and a half away, and that even before that, many experts, including him, are hoping that You'll have therapeutics, so it won't be, hey, this works on malaria, let's try it on COVID-19, but there'll be something that, or, or more than one thing that a doctor could prescribe that is specific to, to, the, uh, to the reality of COVID-19. You know, folks say that, that we could have something in the fall, winter, that would be a huge step in the right direction. So I think it's going to be a number of different pieces of the puzzle that build on each other. A lot to work through. Um when it comes to our incarcerated populations, our inmates who are approved to be released, are they being tested for COVID-19 as they are being released? Yeah, to the, to the uh, and I want to make sure I get this right, to the best of my knowledge, nobody with either COVID-19 nor symptoms that are, uh, that are uh, typical of COVID-19 infected patients are being released. If an inmate does not have symptoms are they, and being released, are they still being tested? If someone is I, asymptomatic? I can't say for sure. So I, I, I would like to come back to you on that, Aaron. Um, I can't say if someone is asymptomatic 
that they're getting tested. But this is a pretty r rigorous review process that we're actually right in the thick of as we speak. And I think it's going to come to a head uh, over, I think, probably midweek next week uh, in terms of what the population actually looks like in terms of who's who's staying and who's getting out for at least a temporary, uh, basically a quasi furlough uh, period. Is the state releasing names and information of inmates who were approved for release? And can we get that information? The answer is no at the moment, uh, and, and and possibly I actually don't know whether what what level of disclosures we'll we'll put out there. But if if we do put it out there, obviously we'll we'll make sure folks get it. Um, will New Jersey offer a relief, uh, some sort of relief for undocumented immigrants? We've seen California do this, and what other help is available for this community? Yeah, I mean I've said this many times, and it's true. We we can't. It isn't just that we're nice people and that we want to do right by everybody, which we do, by the way. And particularly New Jersey is is measured in many respects as the most diverse state in America. But more cold-bloodedly, we don't crack the back. We don't flatten that curve. We don't crack the back of this virus uh, if we only bring some of us along. We got to bring everybody along. So that's uh, folks who don't have legal status. It's folks in our our corrections community. It's the long-term care facilities the developmentally disabled, uh, the homeless. And so we've got a whole series of initiatives that we frankly had mo in many cases in place in peacetime uh, well before this hit. Uh, but we're doing everything we can to find, uh, for instance, using dorm dormitories that we're converting uh, to places that we can use as a quasi shelter for folks, uh, et cetera. So we, we, we are, as I say, we're not going to win this war if we only bring some of us along. Mm. We got to bring everybody along. One final question for you. I know you're a busy, a busy guy right now. Uh, New Jersey, known for its pride, Jersey Strong was the motto after Sandy. Now we've learned that New Jersey's biggest stars are all coming together for a benefit concert to raise money for the state. What does it mean for you to see New Jersey coming together to help each other during this time? It's so such a source of pride. Uh, I think my lawyers tell me I can't raise uh, money for it, but I, I'm going to throw caution on the wind and tell everybody it's New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund, njprf.org. Uh, it's next Thursday night. Uh, I think it's 7 o'clock, uh, and it's a cavalcade. New Jersey is chock full of talent. Bruce Springsteen, John Bon Jovi, right yeah. through the list. And, and it's so not surprising that everyone would come together in an hour of need, unlike any we have seen before, and stand up and stand tall on behalf of Jersey. Jersey strong. All right, Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Aaron.